Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. I want us to turn to Mark 10. We're going to continue in our series on Mark uh, in the presentation. And this is not a great Chinese New Year passage. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't, know, I don't know what you normally expect a Chinese New Year message to contain, right? About like blessings and prosperity and all this kind of stuff. And of course, we don't you know, subscribe to the prosperity gospel, but it's a tough passage. And I just wanted to put that out there because first uh, eight chapters of Mark that we looked through, it was all about who is God. Jesus is the son of God, and he could do these amazing things, and this is what his kingdom looks like, and he was doing all these miracles, and then all of a sudden in chapter 9, as we talked about last week, the, the, the tone starts to turn a little bit darker. It gets a little bit dimmer, and this, this idea of suffering and, and death and sacrifice, you begin to see this darker and darker image all the way until the cross that Jesus goes to Calvary, and It's not the most celebratory, it's not the most exciting, it's not the most New Year's type of thing, but I think it's something that's important that we have to consider, and chapter 10 is no different, because chapter 10 is Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. He's not quite there yet, but he's on the way, and it's it's a lesson in discipleship of what it means to follow Jesus. And, and, And anytime we think about following Jesus, or we think about following a teacher, we think about how can I better follow a teacher? Now, just pause for a moment, and don't raise your hand. How many of us are teachers, or we're in school, and we're taught by a teacher? And you, you ask yourself the question of, how, what is the best way in order to learn? What's the best way in order to grow? What's the best way in order to understand things in a deeper way and collect a deeper understanding? Usually, study more, try harder, get in your book, set aside time. High school students, amen, right? Your teachers tell you... you well, you, you didn't spend enough time studying this past week, did you? Yeah, I, I'm getting them some thumbs over there. And I mean, college students, you're probably, your professors don't care enough to ask you that question. <laughs> but by their exam, they're probably like, you didn't study hard enough. You're like so discouraged afterward. Or even if you're working and your boss is like, that presentation wasn't that great. You, you weren't in the office long enough. You didn't work hard enough on this. And the overall theme and message that we get from the world is effort, and time, and if you have enough of that, then what happens? You're guaranteed success or guaranteed victory. I mean, think about, uh, okay, please don't raise your hand. How many of us, we enjoy watching YouTube videos, motivational YouTube videos? Like when we're down or discouraged, we got to put one of those on, and it's got those, the soundtrack, got those like sports athletes that are like sweating like crazy, and they're like running really hard, and you're like, oh man. And then for like the 10 minutes afterward, you're like, okay, I could do all things through God who's given me strength, right? You're like, I could do it. I just got to do it more. I got to try hard. I got to go at it again. Now, how many of us, you know that life is not linear? How many of these, you know that just putting more effort and more time doesn't work? Like after those 10 minutes, what happens? You're like, oh, you're discouraged again. Oh, it doesn't, didn't work out that I wanted to. You put in all this time and effort and you still get a C or a D. Like, well, what was the point in that? How many of us, we know relationships are not linear? How many of you have put in so much time and energy and effort into that relationship and it didn't work out the way you wanted to? And how many of us, we think, or we understand that our followership of Jesus, who is our greatest teacher, following him, growing to be more like him, learning his ways, is not linear. Time and effort doesn't equal a mature disciple of Christ. It just doesn't. And For some of us, we try to apply the very things that the world has taught us for however many years we've been alive because we've been so inundated with this, do more, try harder, put more effort, time into it, and then you will get victory or then you will get success. We we try to translate that into our spiritual lives and it doesn't work. And we, we sit here and we wonder why and we're confused and discouraged and we want to give up. And I think that's the very thing that Jesus is trying to address because he's saying that the way that you learn to be a disciple of Christ, the way you learn to be a disciple of Jesus is not the way you learn anything else in this world. Because it won't work. It's not going to work. And the way that you follow Jesus is paradoxical. It's, it's in just juxtaposition to how you follow Jesus. And <clears throat> I want to give us, instead of one thing, I decided to give us two things. Happy Chinese New Year. All right? <laughs> two things 
for today, and I want to put this in a, in a little bit of a, a way that's going to help us think of this passage. The two things is that you're not following Jesus unless you give up your way. And you can't give up your way until Jesus shows you his way. Because our way is not his way. His ways are higher than our ways. And we're not following him unless we give up our way, but we're never going to be able to give up our way unless we see and understand his way. And I think that's what he's going to talk about. That's what Mark is going to talk about. He's going to show us Jesus on the way and what it means to follow Jesus. There's three points that I want to go over of what it means to follow Jesus' way instead of our own way. We're going to talk about how Jesus' way is helpless and not being hardened. We're going to talk about how Jesus' way is about giving and not getting. We're going to talk about how Jesus' way is about serving and not succeeding. So let's look at being helpless and not hardened. Uh, Hopefully you've turned to uh, Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at the first 16 verses. And this passage is a little bit long, but I wanted to read it in these big chunks to give us a bigger overview of what the author is trying to say. Uh, Verse 1, it says, And he left there, went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as, as was his custom, he taught them. The Pharisees came up in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold on fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God therefore, what therefore God has joined together, let man, man not separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, "Let Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. So just to give us a little bit of backstory, in Mark 9, remember in in chapters, I believe it was 7, 8, 9, he left the region that the Jews were in. He left Judea. He went to these Gentile regions, Tyre and Sidon. He did these miracles, and he fed the 4,000, and he did some incredible things in the Gentiles. And that was the region that the Jews were not in. So people were like, okay, when are you finally going to go back to Jerusalem? And so here he is going back to Jerusalem. And he's heading back and he's on the way. And like I mentioned, it's a metaphor of discipleship. And I believe that in this whole chapter, chapter 10, he gives us three snippets of Jesus on the way. And he contrasts Jesus' way from the disciples' way or the human way. And In each of these passages, if you look at the structure, you realize there's some kind of confrontation that he has with a group of people or discussion that he has with a group of people. And then he gives the alternative, the Jesus way of doing things. And that's how we're going to look at these passages. So if you look at this first passage, we'll realize the the human way that he exposes is the hardness of our hearts. He exposes the hardness in people's lives. And there's three ways he does that. The first is when when you see the Pharisees, their motivation for doing the things that they did. First thing that it says in the passage is what? They came to test him. Now, anytime someone comes to test you, it's not because you're really wanting to learn. It's not because you're like really desiring to learn from that person or be so humble and teachable. It's because you think that you know, and you're just trying to make sure that other person knows, or you're trying to make that person look like a fool. So the Pharisees, they were trying to make Jesus look like a fool because they thought they knew everything about marriage. They were teachers of the law. They read through scripture, the, the Torah, And uh, they were referencing to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, where it says this, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if he finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of this house, and she departs out of this house, and he gives a couple other conditions. But essentially, what that verse was saying was, you could divorce your wife if you find some kind of indecency in her. And the, the, the teacher of the law were coming to test Jesus, saying, Jesus, do you believe this line of the law? And in that time, the Jews and the Pharisees, they had a very broad understanding of indecency. You could be indecent in your cooking. Like, honey, this cooking is terrible. It's indecent. I don't want to be with you anymore, right? I mean, and this is a little bit of extreme, 
But for almost for any reason, they could say, that's indecent. I have this law, and there's a procedure. I'm going to get a certificate of divorce and send you away. Now, <clears throat> they were doing that to test him, to say, Jesus, do you, do you believe Scripture is Scripture? Because they had Scripture on their side, at least in their interpretation of it. But the bottom line, and, and this is not going to be a sermon on marriage and the sanctity of marriage, but the bottom line is that they felt that they knew what was right. And they wanted to make Jesus look stupid. Now, the other thing that we see about the Pharisees and the way they approach this and the hardness of heart is that they use a contingency as a rule instead of the exception. How many of you would love to fly in an airplane where the pilot used a manual for emergency crash landings to learn how to fly a plane? Anyone? No, none of us, right? You wouldn't trust that person. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying the Pharisees are doing. They're saying, you're, you, he's saying, you're hardening your hearts because what? Moses gave you this law because what? Because you're sinful, you're broken, you're messed up, and you need contingencies for situations that are not ideal. He's saying you're using a crash landing emergency escape manual to understand the sanctity of marriage. He's saying you're taking this divine institution, and that's why he references Genesis and creation. He's saying, you know, th that God created these two as one flesh. What God created and brought together, man should not separate. Now, of course, if adultery is already there, then it's already been broken. That covenant's already separated. But other than that, your, your, your understanding of indecency is so wide and so broad, you're using an emergency manual to determine how you view marriage. And that makes no sense. And it's only because you already have an idea of what you want, what you care about, what you believe, that you're interpreting scripture in this way. Your heart is hardened. And I think it's easy for us to dismiss the Pharisees. And many of us were like, oh, don't be a Pharisee. Don't be legalistic. So it's, it's common understanding that the Pharisees would be hard-hearted. But how many of us, we believe that the disciples are also hard-hearted? And the disciples are very complicit in this passage. <clears throat> Jesus, after he does that confrontation with the Pharisees, what does he do? The disciples come and ask him afterward, say, what did you mean by that? Now, after Jesus gave that very clear explanation, can you imagine, like, what are the disciples saying? What's going on in their hearts for them to ask that kind of question? What did you mean by that? What, what are you talking about? And there's only a couple options. Either, number one, we give them the benefit of the doubt. They really didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying. Like, his explanation was so intricate and so, like, complicated that, like, they needed him to say it again in simpler terms so that they could fully understand. I mean, if that's the case, their heart is still hardened. Now, the other option is that they really agreed with the Pharisees. The other option is that they were complicit with the Pharisees. The other option is that they subscribe, and it wasn't just the Pharisees, but popular Jewish culture and opinion that said you could divorce your wife for any reason, for any purpose. And if that's the case, then all the more, their hearts are just as hardened as the Pharisees. And if you put this into context, it's even more condemning of the, of the disciples. Because if you remember in Mark chapter 6, Jesus, or actually Mark, told the story of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, if you remember, he was beheaded. And I'm going to read it in Mark 6, verse 17, 18. It says this, For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. What is John the Baptist saying? He's saying the Pharisees' interpretation of the law is too broad. He's saying they have this understanding of divorce because in order for Herodias to marry the brother, she had to divorce the guy first in order to marry Herod. And do you remember what happened to John the Baptist? Not only was he thrown in prison, but he was beheaded. So the disciples are looking at that context and they're remembering that happened. And they're like, Jesus, what are you talking about? If you do this, then you're going to suffer the same fate that John the Baptist is going to suffer. The same thing that you're... you're that we're trying to avoid. We don't, want to, we don't want to be thrown in prison. We're supposed to rule and reign. We're supposed to be kings. We're supposed to be, you're supposed to be the Messiah. You're supposed to be this reigning person who conquers. And if you go against the very teachings of the law, then the very same thing that happened to John the Baptist is going to happen to you. They think they know better. They think they're watching out for you. They're like, how is this? This doesn't make any sense. And if, it's, if the disciples who've been following for, with Jesus this whole time, their hearts are hardened. 
I think it would be really proud for us to assume that our hearts are not just as hardened as this. For us to at least question and pause for a second and think back, hmm, do I, do I think I know better than Jesus? I don't think many of us would like consciously come up on stage if I were to invite one of you to say, hey, I think I know better than Jesus. How many of us would be willing to do that? None of us. But how many of us on a day-to-day basis, we live like that, though? In the decisions we make. In the actions and the behaviors that we live out every single day. We think that we know better than Jesus. By the way that we don't trust him. By the way that we don't pray. By the way that we don't honor By the way that we take things in our own hands. We think that we know better than him. And it shows us that our hearts are hard. Now, what is the alternative? Jesus gives the alternative. He says helpless. It's helplessness that you need. He elevates helplessness. In verse 13, you know, verse 1 to 12 is all about his confrontation with the Pharisees and marriage. And all of a sudden he transitions to children. And it seems a little bit um, abrupt. It seems like he's talking about something different. But one thing that's interesting is that he doesn't move locations. It doesn't say, oh, in this next place that he goes to, which is in all the other parts of this passage, he talks about that. And I really feel like what he's trying to do, what Mark is trying to do, he's contrasting Jesus and the children with the Pharisees and the disciples. Where the Pharisees and the disciples are hardened in their hearts, he's saying Jesus and the children are helpless and open and humble. The disciples, what do they do? As soon as people bring them to the disciples, they start rebuking them. Like, we know better. You know, children should not be coming to Jesus. And, you know, it's very curious on why uh, children are treated this way. And this is one of the only times that Jesus is really uh, described as indignant, angry even, in the book of Mark. There's only two other places in the book of Mark that he's described this way. And if you read uh, Mark 9, verse 36 to 37, remember it talks about how, you know, whoever receives a child in my arms receives me, and not only me, but the one who sent me. Not only he says that, but he says, In this passage in Mark 10, he says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child. So no longer saying you have to receive a child, but you have to receive the kingdom of God like a child. You have to be like a child. That's how you receive the kingdom. That's how you follow me. Now, you have to take a step back and ask yourself, how did the people at the time view children? Because I know many of us in today's society, people generally see children as innocent, pure, creative, right? Like, you know, all those TED Talks that talk about how, like, our inner child creativity has been destroyed by education, right? Like, oh, I just want to be back to my childlike state. Or, you know, those uh, NGO videos that try to get you to donate. Like, they put all these images of cute children, right? And then the beginning is, like, dark, and they look famished and stuff like that, and then turns to, like, a nice, happy, playful, right? Like, oh, it's so cute, the children, right? And I think we have a very positive view in children in our culture. But in that culture, children were, were viewed as useless, as helpless. They, 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 they were just seen as like an unnecessary, or not an unnecessary, a necessary uh, time of life before you became an adult where you could actually be useful in contributing to society. They, they just didn't do anything. They didn't know how to do anything. They couldn't do anything. And I think that's exactly Jesus' point. That's exactly Mark's point. He's saying, you got to be like a child. You got to be helpless. You got to be humble. You got to have this attitude where you're like, I don't know anything. Instead of being like the Pharisees, we're like, I know everything. I can do everything. You got to be like, I don't know anything. I can't do anything. Like, I, like being a father is one of the, the greatest joys I have. Like Noah is a year and a half old, almost. He's not quite, you know, you hear about terrible twos and threes where like the children, they, they think they're so independent and they're like, want to do everything by themselves. He's not quite there yet. Thank the Lord, but he will get there soon. But. My, my favorite time, because a year and a half old, and there's something about a child, they just know that they can't do much, right? They know that you as a parent, you're much stronger, much bigger, much more able to do things. My favorite time is when Noah realizes he can't do something, and sometimes, like, one of the things recently was we, uh, one of his aunts got him, like, uh, this toy train set, and, you know, you have to put the tracks together, and the tracks are put together like little puzzle pieces. He knows he can't put the puzzle pieces together. So you know what he does? Like, sometimes I'm working on my computer, and then um, our helper would do, be doing something else, and he'll want to play with his train. So he'll go to the train, he'll take the train tracks out of the box, he'll run to the corner of his, you know, we call it Noah land because it's gated off, so he's in Noah land, and then he takes a train track, he runs to the corner of Noah land as close as he can get to me, takes a train track, he waves it in front of me, he's like, up, 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 right? 
And that's cute, and I understand his language. He's saying, Appa, help me. Daddy, help me, because I can't put the train tracks together. And you know, as a father, you're like, oh, like, right? You're like, it melts your heart. You're like, of course, I will stop anything I'm doing. Doesn't matter how important it is to help you build your train track, because you want to play. Why? Because the child knows that they're helpless. And when, as you, you see as a father, you know your child is helpless. How much more do you want to help them? How much more do you want to provide for them? How much more do you want to care for them? And I'm like, as a child, you know, when, when we see this as a parent, like, it, it makes me get a little glimpse of what God wants for us. For us to be able to get, God, I'm helpless. Father, I, I'm a father. Like, I need you. I'm helpless. I don't know much. Can you show me the way? Teach me. Lead me. Guide me. Show me. But the problem is, after so many years, after not being children, we think we're adults, we think we're capable, we think we're able, we think we got all things put together. And we're like, God, I, I got this. I know how to do it. I'm self-sufficient. I'm able. I know. And so I don't need you. We're, we're just like the Pharisees. We're just like the disciples, hardened in our hearts, thinking that we know when God is saying, you don't know. You got to be like a child. You have to be helpless. You have to be totally like dependent and trusting in him. And many of us, like we're more hard in our hearts than we think that we are. We're more hard in our hearts than we like to believe. We're more hard in our hearts than we want to admit to ourselves. Like I love, one of the things I love about preaching is um, like sharing God's word. And as I'm preaching, like, you know, just being able to see people really being impacted. And one of the things I don't like about preaching is that I could see everyone here, even though you don't think I could see you, I could see you, you know, I could see you like that. Okay, I, I could see all of that, all right? But don't worry, I'm not judging you. I, I'm, I'm not looking at you specifically. I'm just looking at the crowd in general, okay? So don't feel, you know, condemned, all right? I'm not, I don't keep mental notes like, oh, that guy was sleeping. I'm not going to preach hard to him next time either, you know? But I love it because, you know, some, you know, there's certain times where, like, I just get really encouraged because someone's like, oh, God really spoke to me through that and I was really moved and God really worked. And I love that. But I realize that after preaching a certain amount of time, I get hardened when someone else is preaching. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have tuned one of my sermons or Pastor's sermons out? Okay. One person raised their hand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You've turned it out. Why? And I don't know why. I'm not going to judge why, but... One of my experiences, and I don't know about you, I've listened to more of Pastor Seth's sermons than all of you except for Christina, okay? I think Christina probably listened to most of Pastor Seth's sermons more than me, but I've listened to probably 14, 15 years of his sermons. And some of us who've been part of our church for three or four years are like, oh, I already kind of know. How much more do I know the pattern of his sermons than you do, right? Two points, one thing, alliteration. No, it's not, not alliteration anymore, it's rhyming. Sometimes three points. But usually two, usually the first point goes really long, the second point's really short. Um, he knows that, all right? So it's okay. And as I'm sitting there listening, it's so easy for me, like, I've preached before. I know what he's going to say. I know the stories that he's going to tell. I know the illustration. I know the way it's going to be challenging. It's so easy to tune things out. And I remember a couple of times where he was preaching and I had that kind of attitude. And, you know, afterward we say, the pastor's like, we'll pray for you if anyone wants to come up. And so I'm there after pastor preaches the sermon. I'm up here and praying for people. And a couple of people just come up and just say, hey, you know, pastor's sermon just really convicted me today. And like some of them are like just weeping. I'm just like, and, and they're asking me, can you pray for me? I'm like, I think you need to pray for me. Because <laughs> God's word is speaking to you. And I'm so hardened in my heart. So I'm like, Lord, help me to humble myself and recognize that I'm, I'm so hardened in my heart. And I don't know how many of us, we, we can resonate that with that, whether it's a sermon, whether it's a Bible study. We're like, I know what's coming. I know questions. I, I, I'm just going to go through this. But you don't really think about this is God's word. This is what God is doing. And it doesn't have to be a Bible study sermon. It could be a serving opportunity. It could be a vision statement from the family gathering. Like, I know what's coming. Or this is so big and I know how it's going to turn out. And it's not going to amount to much, so who cares, right? There's so many ways that we could be hardened or jaded or think that we know. Rather than being totally open and humble. And the same exact thing, the same sermon, same message, same Bible study, same serving opportunity could be presented to two different people and one person could be totally moved, totally humbled, 
totally ministered and blessed, and the other person could be totally jaded and hardened in their hearts. And the only difference is what? The condition of the heart. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. You Pharisees, you disciples, you're hard in your hearts and you cannot receive the kingdom. Why? Because you're not receiving the kingdom as a child. You're not helpless. You're not dependent. You're not humble. And I want to challenge us. Can we humble ourselves? Odia, one desire fast, a great opportunity to say, God, I don't know. And you could be hardened about the one desire fast. Be like, I've been doing this a couple times before and I didn't get anything out of it. You need to fast before the fast. You need to pray before the fast. God, God, give me a heart that is open and humble. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, you go to another church. You hear a different sermon. If your heart is hard, then you're not going to get anything out of it. Jesus' way is helpless, not hardened. The second way they gives is, is about giving, not getting. It's about giving, not getting. We're going to read verses 17 through 31. And as he was setting out on this journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have. Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. And disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished, said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake or for, and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. We've, we've heard this story many times uh, throughout different gospel stories. In other gospel, he's identified as the rich young ruler. Uh, in Mark, he's just called the man. Mark, Mark is just concise like that. And if you really dig into just the story, like sometimes we do in other gospels because it's segmented off a little bit more like in, in other gospels, then we could just really focus on the rich young ruler, the man, and talk about wealth and how Jesus loved him, which, you know, I think that's, it's really good. But if you put it in the bigger context of what Mark is trying to say, the picture that he's painting, what he's really trying to do is he's contrasting the man and the disciples' response to the man with what? With Jesus' teaching, Jesus' way. He's, he's, he's exposing this attitude of getting with Jesus' way of giving. Now, what, is, what kind of getting is getting exposed? The initial discussion, he's talking about the, the rich young ruler, and, and many of us, we've read this, we know uh, it's a reference to Exodus, right? Where he says, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know, what are the commands? And he refers to the Ten Commandments, or at least half of them. You know, don't steal, adultery, all this kind of stuff. And then he says, oh, I've done all these things since I was a youth. And Jesus is like, one thing you lack, he loved him. He said, go sell all your possessions and then come and follow me. And we read this parable oftentimes, and you know, I don't know if you've heard in other sermons, it's all about being generous, giving your away, away your wealth, you know, and, and that's, that's true. But I don't think Jesus is done. He's not stopped there. If you look, after he has this interaction with the man, and he told the man, like, give up everything, he has this interesting uh, inter interaction with the disciples. And the disciples start asking him questions like, then who can be saved? You know, we, we've done all these things. And, and it's also interesting, you see the reaction of how they're described, the emotions that come out. They're, they're amazed, like, whoa, like astonished, like, uh-oh, or like afraid. You know, there's, the, there's these like really shocking, or there's your shock as if they've never heard some of these things before. And you start to wonder like, hmm, are the disciples really on the way, on the same page as Jesus is? 
Or is Mark and Jesus really trying to expose not only the rich young ruler, because we're, I, I don't know how many of us are like, oh yeah, I'm the rich young ruler. Because none of us are like, I'm super wealthy. And I, I probably bet you that the disciples didn't think that they're like the rich, they're like, I'm a poor fisherman. I left everything. I'm not like the rich young ruler. And many of us, we're probably not like that. I'm, okay, if you are like Li Ka Shing or around his grade, let me know. You know, let us know as a church, like, where's our tithing going? You know, it's not, it's not showing up. You're, you're hiding something from us, you know. <clears throat> but the disciples were poor fishermen. They're like, I- I'm giving all that I have. And Jesus is saying, you still have the same attitude. You still have the same paradigm as the rich young ruler. How do we see that? Uh, the man and the disciples, they ask the same question. I want to show two parallels here. Verse 17, what does the rich young ruler say? He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then later on, the disciples say what? Verse 26. Then who can be saved? Who can be saved? They're asking, like, how, how do we get the salvation? How do I get the salvation? And then the man and the disciples answer Jesus the same way. In verse 20, the rich young ruler says what? Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. I've done all these things, the commandments. I follow all of them. And then in verse 28, what do the disciples say? See, we have left everything and followed you. We've done everything. We've done everything you've asked of us. And what they omit when they say that we've done everything that you've asked of us, what do they omit? What they're really saying in their hearts is when are we going to get ours? When are we going to get our share? When are we going to get what's deserving of us? When are we going to get what's owed to us? What are we going to get what our efforts and time and behavior has merited from you. But how many of us, God doesn't owe us every, anything. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe everything to God. Why? Because we've sinned against him. We've broken his covenant. We've broken our promises to him. And God doesn't owe us anything. But oftentimes, when we follow him, we think that we, God owes us so many things. And it exposes our greed, it exposes our mindset of we got to get something. That's why we follow God. It expo- exposes not just in the material things. It's not just about your finances. It's not just about your possession. It's about the whole way that we spend our resources and, and the way that we live our lives. How many of us, we, we, we do things in church in order to get things from God? Now, Jesus contrasts this getting with saying, you got to have a paradigm of giving you got to have a paradigm of giving. And he, he says it in an indirect way. Number one, he says, for all things are impossible with man, right? But all things are possible with God. Now, we love that verse because we're like, all things are possible with God. Amen, right? We're like, yes, Lord. But what is he saying? He said, you have to admit that it's impossible for you. You have to admit that you're not going to get it in your own ability to get things. What else does he say? You're going to get these houses. Yes, you've given up all these things, but what are you going to get? Sometimes you're going to get persecution. Like, if you notice, the houses and the brothers and sisters, all those are repeated exactly the same, except for Jesus at the end, and with persecutions. How many of us, we want persecution? I don't see any hands raised this time. But sometimes when you follow Jesus, there's going to be persecution, and you're going to be like, God, why why am I getting this? I don't deserve this. And Jesus' point is that if you're going to be first, you're going to be last. If you're going to be last, you're going to be first. He repeats this in Mark 8. We read a couple chapters ago. He says, Forever who would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. How many of us, we really have internalized this idea that this Christian walk is not about getting things from God? Yes, there's eternal life. Yes, you know, all these promises are made true in Christ Jesus, but that's not the point. What is the point? What is the the shorter Westminster Catechism? what What is the chief end of man? To give glory to God forever, to worship him, to enjoy him forever. It's not about us. It's not about getting for us. It's not about this eternal, perfect paradise life in heaven that we so enjoy. 
Yes, that's, that's a consequence. Yes, that's, a, that's, a, that's part of our enjoyment. But the purpose, the main thing is we give glory and honor to God. We give him glory. We give him honor. Our lives are meant to be lived for him, not for us. If at any time we think our Christian lives are for us, then we miss the whole point. It's about giving to God because we know that God has given everything to us. We have no more need. And therefore, our whole lives are for him. All my illustrations are like toddler baby illustrations. I realize this because this is what life is. But there's so much you can learn from having a kid. So if you want to become like Christ, have a child. (laughs) Get married first and then have a child. It's so interesting. Like, as a parent, one of the joys of having a, a baby is, like, you seeing them grow up. And not just seeing them grow up, but, like, the, the smiles, the laughs, like, the times that they're, like, super cute. And as a parent, it's really easy to be like, oh, I just want my child to be like that all the time. But parents, how many of you know your baby or child is never always like that? Amen? Okay? Not getting many amens. I guess you all have perfect children who are always obedient all the time. Mine is just a wicked sinner, you know, he's, he's the only person. <laughs> and it's so interesting that when my attitude is try to get those laughs and giggles from him, I don't get it. When I try to control him, when I try to get what I want from him, he doesn't give it to me. But then when I have this attitude of, hey, Noah, like, I'm just interested in what you're interested in. I'm just trying to give you love and attention, and I want to I play with you in the way that you want to play. Guess what happens? He's like the most cute and fun and enjoyable kid to be around. And I, I don't know, it just like stuck, struck out to me like, man, like, if my attitude is constantly trying to get stuff from him, then I'm never going to be able to enjoy the relationship I have with him. But it's when I shift my paradigm and realize like my purpose as a parent is to give to him, to love on him, to provide for him. That's when this joy and this just love comes out. It's like, wow, it's just a shift. Now, of course, I could, I could, you know, those of you who are like think extra layers like inception, you could take that and be like, okay, if I really want to get something from him, I got to give to him first and then I can get for myself, right? You could do that. You could, you could go upon layer upon layer. But hopefully that just convicts you of your wickedness of your heart, right? It's still about you. But realizing, like, like why don't I realize that's exactly the way I I ought to relate with God? Is I don't relate with God, and I, I don't give to him just so I can get something from him, but because I enjoy being with him. I love him. This is my relationship with him. This is just part of being together with him. This is part of following him. It's about giving. It's not about getting. Because when you, when you have this paradigm and an idea of just getting for yourself, then you're going to be in a totally different place. You're not following Jesus. He's going to leave you, leave you beside the road. You're not going to be on the road with him. Because you're going to be missing the point. You're gonna, no wonder we're tired. No, man, no wonder we're burnt out. Because we're like, oh God, you expect so many things of me. And I just constantly got to give, give, give to you. And when am I ever going to get? Don't raise your hand. How, how many of us, we have that kind of mentality when we're serving when we're asked to do something, we're like, oh God, I can't do this. I can't do that. Rather than having an attitude of, God, my whole life, my whole orientation is about giving because you've given me everything that I need. I'm I'm praying that we would see that, that we would shift our perspective and orientation to see that and follow Jesus in that way. Last thing, we see that following Jesus on the way and his way is about serving not about succeeding. It's about serving and not succeeding. This is the last chunk of text. This is a little bit longer, but again, they're connected, so I want to read it together. Verses 32 through 52. It says, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Remember, see, the, the, the amazed and afraid, that they're still there. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, 
You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that, <clears throat> the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be also be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who am, for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to them, they called him to, they, Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples by a great, and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to crowd and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his slight sight and followed him on the way. You'll notice there's this constant theme of repeating on the way, on the way, on the way. And, and like I mentioned before, it's a, it's a metaphor that as Jesus is literally on the way to Jerusalem, he's saying, and he's giving these teachings and these you know, discussions. He's saying, this is the way that you ought to follow me. This is what it means to be on the way with me, following me as a disciple of Christ. And like we've been sharing, Jesus contrasts what it means to be on his way versus what it means to live our way, the human way. And the way that he's exposing, he's, he's exposing the succeeding nature way that we love to live life. The succeeding is exposed. Jesus, in this passage, he talks about his suffering for the third time. And like, I was telling, I was, I don't know, I was just, I'm a Bible geek in some ways. And I was telling Erica, like, this passage is so cool. It's really cool. I hope you guys can say that about the Bible one day. Lord, have mercy, please. Like Mark, just the way that it's written, like, it's such an amazing work of literature. It's such an amazing work of God's word and his truth. Like, you realize that he sandwiches this whole section of, of scripture. He talks about his his death. He, he predicts his death three times. And what sandwiches those three predictions is what? The blind man at Bethsaida. He healed that man. He predicts his death three times. And then he heals this other blind man named Bartimaeus. And he sandwiches it for a reason. What is he trying to say? He's saying something about your sight. The way that you see, the way that you see what it means to follow me has to be connected to my suffering and my death. And he ends this section with the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Why? Because right after this passage, we're going to talk about it in the future in, uh, in Mark 11. That's where he eventually goes into Jerusalem and he starts com having confrontations with the Pharisees. And eventually that will lead to his death. It's, it's incredible. That's, sorry, that's just like a side point. I'm just like amazed by it. But I think the reason why I share that is because what he's really trying to help us to see is that servanthood, I, I know there's a lot of, uh, like business literature. How many of us are business students out here? Anyone heard of servant leadership? Yeah, servant leadership. It's like the cool new trend. Well, I mean, it's not the cool new trend. It's been around for several decades. But it's like servant leadership is the great new way in order to be a great leader and get all these people to follow you. And in some ways, at least within Christian circles or at least those kind of business circles, you're like, wow, servant leadership, awesome. Let's be servants together. How many of you actually want to be a servant? None of us. Like, that's your career. That's your job. You do house chores for someone seven days a week, 20, no, 12 hours a day. And there are people in Hong Kong, that, that's their living. And I think, you know, in, in Jesus' eyes, it's, it's not any lower than any other vocation. But in our society, it's the lowest of low. The domestic helpers here are treated like really poorly. If you read the news and you see the, the, the benefits and the provisions that are given by the government, it's, it, it's very minimal. 
They're not treated as citizens like everyone else. They can't get PR. So how many of us, we want to be servants? None of us. But he's saying, this is what it means to follow me. He's saying your idea of success is so warped and so humanly driven. What does he say? He's predicting his death. He's saying, this is the life of suffering that you need to go on. He's saying, I'm going to die. And his third prediction of his death is the most detailed one. He talks about not only that he's going to die, but he's going to get flogged, crucified, spit on, tortured, all of this kind of stuff. He adds that detail in there. And it's hilarious that Mark, as soon as he finishes outlining what Jesus said, what's the next thing that the disciples do? James and John, and keep in mind, remember who, uh, who did Jesus take up to the mountain, transfiguration, to see his glory? Peter, James, and John. These are Jesus' closest disciples, the ones that knew him the best, the ones that he entrusted himself most to. And James and John, what do they start talking about after Jesus? Like, I'm going to get crucified. I'm going to die. They're going to do all these crazy things to me. And they're like, Jesus, when you are in glory, can we sit next to you on, on your right and your left? And keep in mind what they thought glory was, is Jesus is going to be king of Israel. They thought that he was going to lead an army to conquer the Romans and usher them out. And they thought that once he's sitting on the kingdom, the temple's rebuilt, they build this huge army, then James and John are going to be led his left and his right, sitting, ruling with Jesus in a human way. They wanted what? Success. They wanted military domination. They wanted to not only mil military dominate, but after domination, they wanted to rule. They wanted to be the, left, the second and the third person in the whole kingdom. And it's, it's not just them. The disciples, they were indignant. Again, that same word, indignant, angry with James and John. Why? Not because they were like, wow, J James, John, you're so proud. You don't know Jesus' heart. No, they're indignant because they're like, how come you guys are looking for that glory? You say, what about us? Are you leaving us out? The disciples are inundated with the same success mindset that James and John were. And they're on the same success drug that everyone else was. And the question for us is how many of us, okay, I mean, I, I think all of us, we want to be successful, right? Anyone not want to be successful? Anyone want to be unsuccessful? Okay, all right. Like we all want to be successful. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the success in and of itself. But I think what Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, success is not your primary objective. Your primary objective is what? Servanthood. It's serving others. He elevates serving. And we look at why does Jesus respond the way that he does? When James and John say, hey, you know, grant us to sit on your left and your right, what does he say? Can you, uh, he, he, he has this very like interesting question about the cup and the baptism, which he never fully explains. Now, if you read some commentaries, you'll note that the cup represents suffering, persecution. It was in some way related with God's wrath, the cup of God's wrath. If you think about baptism, what was he talking about? Baptism is a sign of what? Purification. It was also suffering through hardships and trials that Jesus was going to go through. And his baptism was a foreshadow of what? His death and resurrection. That was dying to self and being risen again, resurrecting. He was saying, yes, you will. But they didn't understand that. They thought, they thought it was going to be something glorious. But he's saying, it, what it means to follow me is not success as you see it, but servanthood, dying to self, experiencing suffering, experiencing servanthood in a way that you don't understand. And then he continues on. He, he reinforces it by saying, if any of you would want to be great, you are what? A servant. And if any of you would want to be first, you are a what? A slave. And they still don't get it. <laughs> I think that's the hardest part. But this whole passage, you never see the disciples turn around. You never see them be like, oh, Jesus, you're right. Let me serve. They're left in that place. And I think it's, it, it's really humbling for us to say, how many of us, we think we're greater than Peter, James, John? How many of us are greater than Doubting Thomas. None of us would say that. Because they saw you. They walked with him for three years. But, and if the, the disciples are like this, clueless, thinking about success, how much more are we? The way that we grow up, the way that our parents have raised us, the way that society gives us all this information to say, if you don't do this, you're not going to get this. If you don't uh, you know, measure up to this, then you're never going to succeed in life. 
And I think it's a really good moment to ask us, like, why are we, why are we Christian? Why are we here? Why do we come to church on Sunday? Like, are we trying to be more successful in, and you fill in the blank. I come to church and I'm a good Christian because I want to be successful in the calling that God has given to me. And the calling is in my work and I want to be successful in my work. And I need God's blessings for that. I want to be successful in my relationships. And I want to make sure that I'm approved by everyone. So I come and I do my good Christian duty so that people can see me as a good Christian and approve of me. Therefore, I'm successful in my relationships. I think in so many more ways than one, like we're so, we've, we've dug ourselves so deep into this hole of success that like we can't ever imagine being unsuccessful. We can't ever imagine saying, you know what? Success is not my main priority. Servanthood is. If you were to look back on your time 20 years from now and people were able to say, hey, he did this, this, and this, and this. How many of us, we would write things like, oh yeah, he, he, he uh, changed this company. You know, he made this much money, right? Or he had this many relationships. Like we all want that kind of stuff. And I think it would be just ignorant of us to somehow assume that we're not really driven by success. But how many of us 20, 30 years from now, maybe on our tombstone, will we want to say like, and, and maybe it will be written of us, he served well. He served other people well. He loved other people well. She loved other people well. She gave her life for others. And to be able to hear Jesus and God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He didn't say, well done, my good and successful person. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, you're probably wondering, like, where does Bartimaeus come into this? Why is it so significant? Well, it's Jesus' way. I, I really think that he, he adds this and he concludes this whole section of the blind man because it's, he's, he's saying, this blind guy is the way that you ought to follow Jesus. This blind guy is the way that you ought to honor him, that you, you ought to be a disciple of Jesus. How, how is Bartimaeus portrayed? What is he, first of all, where is he? He's on the side of the road. He's ostracized. He's humble. He's helpless. He's not hardened. In fact, if anything, he is like all the more, um, what's it called? Unashamed. He's like, son of David, help me. Please have mercy upon me. You don't cry out for mercy unless you recognize you're helpless. And what else does he do? He doesn't, he doesn't continue to say like all these amazing things. You'll notice he, he, uh, Jesus asks him the same exact question he asked James and John. James and John were saying, hey, we want you to give us this kind of thing. Remember Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And James and John are like, please, the kingdom, right? On your left and your right. And then Jesus says, hey, what do you want me to do for you? To the blind man, what does he say? I just want to see. Teacher, I just want to see. I just want to see you. I just want to see the way that you're going. And we know he wants to follow him. Why? Because what does he do at the end of the passage? He says, he not only got his sight, but he followed Jesus on the way. It wasn't for himself. He wasn't trying to get. He was trying to receive sight so that he could what? Follow Jesus and give. And on the road, following Jesus is not a life of glamour and and awesome, instead of leaving Jesus, instead of succeeding in the world's turn, right? He could have used his sight and be like, okay, I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to plant my own crops. I'm going to do all this kind of stuff. He's, what did he do? He followed Jesus. He said, I'm going to be a servant of Jesus. I'm going to follow him. I think it's, it, it's, it's incredible that Jesus or Mark uses this blind man. And I think maybe if we were to end this passage the question for us is, what does it really mean to see? And are we the ones who really see? Or are we the ones who are actually blind? And are we the ones who are actually following Jesus on the way as his disciple? Or are we really following our own way?
And my prayer and my hope is that we remember that the only way that we could follow Jesus is that we recognize that Jesus has demonstrated that way through his own life. Who was the one who was most helpless on the cross? He submitted himself to the Father's will. It was Christ. Who was the one who gave his life as a ransom for many? He says it right in this passage. The Son of Man will do that. He gives his life as a ransom for many. He doesn't live to get. And who is the one who serves? He doesn't succeed in the world's eyes. In fact, the whole world considered him a failure because of his death. But he serves. That's his primary goal. He does all those things. Why? Because he knows that we cannot on our own. But he invites us to say, hey, I'm living this life and I invite you to follow me. I invite you because it doesn't take you more effort, doesn't take you more time, doesn't do all this kind of stuff to be helpless, to be humble, but to be like blind Bartimaeus, just to say, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. I think that's all that he asks of us to start on this journey with him. That's why the two things is that you're not following Jesus unless you give up your way. And you can't give up your way unless, until Jesus shows you his way. Uh, there's just a couple of next steps I want to give us. It's just ask Jesus to humble your heart and heart. Just ask him. We can't unharden our own hearts. We just can't. That's what it means to be helpless. Like, I don't know how many of you have been frustrated with yourself because you can't grow or you don't feel connected with God and you get angry at the fact that you're angry or at the fact that you're frustrated. You're like, God, I just can't do this. Sometimes we just have to give up and we're like, God, I'm, I don't know. Second one is ask Jesus to show you how to give instead of get. Again, part of it is the financial aspect about money specifically. And I think it's really helpful and important for us to really think about, God, how am I using my money for your purposes, giving it to others rather than getting it for myself? But also not just within the financial section. It's like my whole life, my whole perspective, like how am I using my time and my resources? Is it all about me trying to get something or am, do I have a posture of giving? And then thirdly is ask Jesus to help you to serve instead of succeed. Think about what is your life really about? I think it would be really good to ask yourself, if you were at your end, what would you want people to say about you? Is it all about success and the things you accomplished? Or do you want to be able to say, here are the words that Jesus said, well done, my good and faithful servant. He served well. He loved well. She loved well. My prayer would be that. We would hear all of that. Can we stand together? We're going to respond. I was just thinking about Chinese New Year again. And how when you think about life, oftentimes we latch on to the good moments. We wanna we love the times that we have a break, pause from work, no school, we get just to relax, we get to enjoy. Those are, you know, those are the great moments that we remember. The reality of life is life is not a series of holidays. It's not a series of moments that we get to like feast and do all this kind of stuff. It comes with a lot of hardship. And I think that's what Mark really paints a, a really good picture of. Even though it is Chinese New Year today. Maybe what Mark is trying to do is give us a reality check. That the real celebration isn't until Jesus comes back. Not until we get to be with him. Yes, there are little moments that we get glimpses of it here in this earth. It's not really till we get there. But this life here, it's going to be hard. It's a life of suffering and sacrifice and humility and getting humble and giving instead of getting. And that's the reality. That's, that's what we have to expect when we follow Christ. And some of you, especially if you have family here, 
you, you're feeling that right now because you're like, man, I hate holidays, especially Chinese New Year, because visiting family is terrible. I have to face and confront a lot of things I don't want to. I'd rather be on. I'd rather be at work. I know I had some colleagues before when I was working in, in my workplace. They would rather work late at work because they didn't want to go home. And that's the reality that we face every single day. Life is hard, and following Jesus is not easy. And it's only until we embrace that, we accept that, and we recognize that's actually the way that Jesus wanted us to follow him, that we're actually going to be his real disciples. I'm praying that we wouldn't be so discouraged and think like, oh shoot, am I a real Christian? But really start to examine ourselves like, Lord, how have I been following you? Have I really been following you or have I been following myself? And it will, maybe we uh, strayed off a little bit from the path. We've gone a little bit 90 degrees off the right way. We can always come back. With God, everything is possible. So can we just respond in prayer? Can we just come before him and say, God, there are, there are so many things that are difficult, but Lord, this life of following you is, is so difficult. It's so hard. And I, I'm not able to do it on my own. But God, I ask and I come before you because it's when I acknowledge that this life is difficult. It's, it's when I acknowledge that following you is not about me. And it's so hard to not make it about me. It's only when I acknowledge that that I that it begins I begin to realize I begin to internalize I begin to be able to actually follow you. Just even that first realization is where it starts. Can we just pray that prayer Lord just a prayer of acknowledgement, a prayer of realization, a prayer of understanding? That was exactly what the disciples lacked. They lacked understanding. They didn't understand what Jesus was doing. They didn't understand why he was saying all these things about suffering. And if God could get, just give us a little bit more of that deeper understanding, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, I believe that he's going to give us the ability, the perspective, and the paradigm to follow him in all areas of our lives. Can we just respond to him just for the next minute or two? Just pray and come before him. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.